tal? Bienvenidos a Vidas. Hoy vamos a conocer a un cineasta que cuando adolescente formó su primera compañía productora. Así rodó algunos cortos como La revancha de las bestias colosales. Aunque en realidad nosotros lo conocemos por películas como Halloween, La cosa y vampiros. Él es John Carpenter, un director, guionista y músico que disfruta con los gritos de horror ajeno. Carpenter pertenece a una generación de directores que se ha mantenido al margen de los grandes estudios. Su filmografía es irregular y por lo general de bajo presupuesto. Como compositor, su manera de integrar la música a sus escenas es ya un sello de autor y una de sus técnicas maestras. El nombre de John Carpenter se ha transformado en una marca que garantiza entretenimiento y sobresaltos. Vamos a conocer su historia en vidas. I don't believe my work life would have ever been what it has been if it wasn't for John Carpenter. He's who he is, because he is the authority. He sees the world differently than anybody else. He sees it slightly askew. He understood that in order to become successful, you had to have a name recognition. He's in the business of, ah! you know, he likes to, you know, he wants to shock you. John Carpenter. En una carrera de más de tres décadas, John Carpenter hizo más de 20 películas. Una figura reservada y muy independiente, Carpenter escribe, edita, dirige y compone la música de sus películas, todo él solo. Siempre un enigma han llamado a Carpenter el príncipe de las tinieblas, el de la violencia y el poeta patrono de las películas de fantasía. I was born in 1948 in Carthage, New York. Dad was a PhD in music, played the violin. I lived up there until my dad got a job in Southern Kentucky, teaching at a university. This is Kentucky, the bluegrass state. More than 40,000 square miles of rolling, fertile land. So we moved, the, Mississippi River, the family moved down to Bowling Green, Kentucky. Population is mainly rural. And I think probably that was the biggest influence on my um, filmmaking career because my family and I, we were very out of place there. This was the Bible Belt in the Jim Crow South in the old days, okay. We were Yankees and I had no idea where I was, what was going on, who these people were, what their beliefs were about. So I felt very much an outsider. I think I found my, my love of, of, of life and my survival in both music and movies. I tell you from its size and its appearance, this thing came from outer space. I fell in love with movies, uh, all kinds of movies. I just loved the experience of going but watching them and the idea that somebody would direct them was fascinating to me. I just think I discovered that when I was about eight or nine years old. Mom and I went to the movies and, and we went to see It Came From Outer Space, which is an early 3D movie. The opening sequence, this meteor comes shooting across the sky and blows up. I was very young at the time and that profoundly frightened me. I jumped up and, and yelled, ran, because I thought I was in danger. <coughs> when I got to the back of the theater, I thought, man, but that's cool. I want to see a little bit more of that. Let me see you as you really are. I was especially attracted to the kind of horror sci-fi world. That was, that was really interesting to me. EC Comics was a big influence on me. Weird science, yeah, things like that. Tales from the Crypt, I love that kind of stuff. 
John and I were probably, you know, among the, the, the hundreds or thousands of people that were under the bedspread with a flashlight because they weren't allowed in the house. Uh, I don't know where, what it was like in Kentucky, but in, I grew up in the Bronx with, in a Catholic family, and <laughs> I had to sneak all that stuff. But this was back in the 50s and 60s. There wasn't a lot of opportunity back then to have friends who enjoyed the same thing. It's not like it is today. Today, popular culture rules. Where back then it was, if you love something like that, you were kind of an outsider and weird. We didn't have a television, so I wasn't. I wasn't a TV addict at all. Did see Elvis when he was on the Ed Sullivan show on somebody else's house. I remember that. I've been profoundly influenced by my dad and his love of music. Music's second nature to me. It's just something I've always grown up with. La influencia de su padre no se limitó a la música. My dad had a home movie camera. He gave it to me when I was eight. And he had a, there was an editing uh, splicer projector a screen so I decided to make my own little films and uh, I learned a lot of very simple techniques about movie making a medida que Carpenter crecía también crecía su fascinación por el cine as I kept saying I wanted to be in the movie business and be a director my dad said oh you don't want to do that not really why don't you get a good job you know but that was the typical of the times, you know. People like me from this little town didn't get to be movie directors. It wasn't possible. It was 1968 and I had to make a decision about what I was gonna do with my life. I was making good money in the rock and roll band, meeting girls and, and making bucks and playing. But I thought, now's the time to do something about this love of movies. If I'm going to do something now, do it now. I got accepted at USC, which was known as the best film school in the world. So, off I went. And uh, it was a very different uh, place in those days. This was during a lot of the, uh, the unrest over the Vietnam War. So that was going on as a backdrop. Stop the bombing and stop the war! A lot of radicals going on around there. It was uh, 1968, 69, 70. But that aside, I learned everything, every basic idea about filmmaking that I now have from film school. Camera, sound, lighting, mixing, acting, writing, editing. I bet this is it. This is the one. Exactly the ones we cut on Rockabilly. I mean, why would Carpenter would sit here and he'd go like this when he saw a cut, he'd go, and that'd be the cut. I met John... Uh, probably in 1967-68, when I went to film school at uh, the University of Southern California. That was my first uh, relationship with John. We both came out of the 60s wanting to be rock stars. We wound up creating a uh, kind of fictitious rock group called uh, the Coupe de Villes. And we would do the scores for some of the movies that we did. Una de las primeras bandas de sonido que compuso Carpenter fue para una película corta como alumno, La Resurrección de Bronco Billy. La película fue una suave elegía del western. Como el mismo Carpenter, el personaje principal es un forastero que fantasea con ser un vaquero héroe. Billy ganó un premio de la Academia y fue la primera película de un alumno en ser estrenada comercialmente en la nación entera. Sometimes at film school people would stand out. They they just you can tell there's something going on there. You couldn't tell in advance and couldn't predict John Carpenter's success, but you certainly knew he had his own way of doing things. He was just plain talented and he was also a leader. Al regreso veremos su primer largo, una producción que costó 64 mil dólares y fue un éxito en Londres. Después Jamie Lee Curtis nos dirá cómo fue el rodaje de Halloween, una cinta que tiene al menos seis secuelas. Ya regresamos con más músico y guionista John Carpenter. La 
La película que le dio su primera oportunidad profesional fue Estrella Oscura, la cual el mismo Carpenter la describió como esperando a Godot en el espacio. Comenzó siendo un proyecto estudiantil y luego fue trabajada para un lanzamiento comercial. We just didn't have any fear. That was the crazy thing about it. We believed that we could make a feature. And we did. Not that it's a great movie. It's it's painful in some ways to watch now, but when you realize for its time and realize how young we were and how little we knew, it's it's an interesting accomplishment. Sergeant Pinback calling bomb number 19. Do you read me bomb? Bomb number 19 to Sergeant Pinback. I read you. Continue. Doing a science fiction movie that took place in outer space, space suits, special effects was unheard of really at film school. But he had the kind of genius of Dan O'Bannon to help him in the midst of all that. Dan was using, I think, old egg crates for uh, and painting them up and sticking them on parts of the ship to make it look, give, give it some modeling. But if you look closely, you realize that these were all kind of silly things. And he did, he did a wonderful pastiche, you know, of uh, creating this uh, this world with no, absolutely no money. I mean, it was just with trash. It was started out as a student film. It became a feature film. Uh, was recut, reworked, rescored. Uh, and it was a real, uh, again, another big giant learning experience about Hollywood and the movie business. And what uh, what does it all mean? And how do you get something from from an idea to a feature? La siguiente película de Carpenter después de Estrella Oscura fue Asalto al Precinto 13, de bajo presupuesto. Era un thriller ambientado en un suburbio decadente de Los Ángeles. That was my second film, and that was a movie that didn't get a lot of attention in the United States. It was released to mixed business and not great reviews, and uh, but in Europe, in England, especially at the London Film Festival, it was a uh, it was liked. That was kind of the beginning of my of my career. John, when I interviewed with him to become the script supervisor on Assault on Precinct 13, um, we had a lot of, you know, common references, things like Howard Hawks, love of his movies and things like that. And so my first working experience with John was on the set of Assault on Precinct 13. Hill y Carpenter tuvieron una relación romántica y ella también produjo muchas de sus películas. La primera de su trabajo en conjunto fue Halloween, filmada con un muy bajo presupuesto. Por un tiempo fue la película de terror independiente de mayor éxito y estableció el género de las cuchilladas en las películas norteamericanas. La película se centra en un asesino psicópata, Michael Myers, que causa estragos en un pueblo norteamericano muy parecido al pueblo donde John se crió. When I saw Halloween, I thought it was the perfect horror movie. I thought it was the quintessential horror movie because it just stood right up and said, here it is, guys, this is what it's about. Don't worry about the causes. Don't worry about anything else. Here's this guy. He is going to get you. And uh, and at the end, it, you know, it order's not restored in the end of that either. He's still out there somewhere. What John said was that if you can create a real sense of these people being real, tree-lined streets, girls walking home talking about boys, school books, knee socks, real places in real time. And give the audience enough of that screen time with those real people. When you start to introduce elements that are unreal, you will believe they're happening because you believe where you are. All the sort of the tropes that we now think of as terribly cliched, the killer's point of view, the, um, the build-up to the shocks, the people in danger, all those things are sort of laid out in Halloween in a very 
straightforward way. And the problem with watching it now is that you think when you watch it now that you're watching a bunch of cliches. And of course, Halloween was the thing that made them cliches. It worked because it was so simple, because it was so straightforward. One of the reasons it, it is that simple is they simply didn't have a lot of money. You know, the budget was tiny and the, 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 the technology was tiny that they could have and they, they had one trailer. Todos apoyaban porque entendían que había un bajo presupuesto. On the opening shot of the movie, I am the hands of the little boy and who reaches in, takes the knife and carries the knife through the house and up to the girl. What Carpenter does is to take a series of situations in which there is somebody in a, in a situation of danger, usually a sexual situation, and just play it to the hilt. I mean, you think about the Halloween set pieces, there's really you know, five or six set pieces, and that's the whole film. The opening sequence with that incredible, it's not steady cam, it's panaglide, it's very early, has now become so imitated. You know, the, the killer's point of view, and you know, we see him stalking around the house, going up the stairs, seeing it. It's just an extraordinary opening. A steady cam, or, or a panaglide, is a, uh, basically a camera system that attaches to the operator. It's a gyroscopic system. You wear the camera. You can use it um, in place of a dolly shot. You can walk up and down stairs. And it's used all the time now. I suppose my sense of composition has always gone in movies to uh, Panavision or Cinemascope or widescreen. Basically, it's a, it's a rectangle. If you look at that frame size and you telescope it and you watch it from the beginning to the end, it begins to get more claustrophobic. So at the end of the movie, we're inside this closet in this small box. And so Jamie, as Laurie Strode, when she starts the movie, has a very big canvas by which to work with. And as we go through the movie, it, it, the canvas gets smaller and smaller and smaller. You never see any blood. When the people are killed, there's a glimpse of the knife. You know, the, uh, Michael Myers holds the knife up, we cut to the victim, the knife is stabbed, and then you cut to the victim's face as he dies. Uh, 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 Hello? I do think that people were surprised by it. I think nowadays, you, you, know, you know Halloween so well that you think, oh, well, you know, nobody could be really scared by this. But when Halloween opened in cinemas, it worked because it scared audiences not because it really impressed critics in the way that perhaps the Salt and Precinct 13 did, but because it really scared audiences. And it made everyone realize that there was money to be made in them, their slasher hills. Con un presupuesto de solo 300 mil dólares, la enormemente exitosa Halloween recaudó más de 75 millones de dólares en todo el mundo. Uno de los motivos por el cual logró aterrar al público fue la música, compuesta por el mismo Carpenter. I got a pair of bongos for Christmas. I can't remember why particularly. And uh, my dad was showing me 5-4 time, teaching me what the difference is between that and 4-4. Four, four. And basically the, the rhythm that I learned to play was the theme from Halloween. It's in 5-4 time. Boom, 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 boom. That's, it's directly the same thing. All I did was apply it to the piano. All this art is a communication, so John selected those notes in that rhythm and doing it on a piano as the communication which now is associated with that image. And these, this theme and Michael Myers are inseparable. I mean, the tension that comes from his insistent rhythms and the, and the fact that, that, you know, you know what's coming or you know something is coming and it changes and it shifts and, 
and he's terrifically able to follow that. Look at how effective, you know, Herman's music was to the to Psycho. Uh, I mean, you take the music out of Psycho and it's a little flat, you know. The, the music is, is very important. Uh, the Exorcist, uh, Tubular Bells. If you were Tubular Bells and didn't see the movie, you'd say, well, it's a pretty interesting song. It's kind of neat. It kind of repeats. You put it to that, to that movie, and it's suddenly a really frightening thing. Carpenter ha editado varios discos, incluyendo una versión especial para celebrar los 20 años de Halloween. Una película que en el 78 costó 300 mil dólares y hasta la fecha ha recaudado más de 75 millones. Ya venimos con más en Vidas. Ya regresa Vidas. John's music woke me up to the idea that you don't need to punctuate with orchestra and with, uh, you don't have to be manipulative in that uh, expansive a way. My music's like carpet. You have come into an apartment you hire me to put carpet down. I'm going to put a carpet underneath your feet. It's going to support you, but you're not going to notice it after a while. It's going to be invisible. So the music needs to be invisible. It needs to just be under there and support what it is that's going on in the scene. The music is like his vacation. That's how he gets away from the, the, the editing and the, the dealing with the studio and the publicity and all that. And he just comes over and he just like turns off the phone and he plays. And it's just fun. I don't want to, I don't want somebody telling me how to do it, so I'm not going to tell anybody else how to do it. I would never deem to do that. He really uh, gives you that feeling that, okay, you're going to do something for me. It's, it, it's not going to be what I would do myself if I could do what you're going to do. But that's fine because I know I'm going to enjoy it and I will take the best you can give me and put it in my movie. One of the things John said to me, he says, Alan, there's only one thing about doing the score for this thing, he says. The only rule is there are no rules. John's one of the few people because he has such a good grasp on music. It's never a problem for him. He's right up to it. Knows when he should be in there playing something, or knows when he should have somebody else play something, or knows when there should be absolute quiet. Cuando Carpenter hizo La Niebla, extendió los elementos sobrenaturales de Halloween e hizo un thriller completamente gótico. La niebla se trata de una banda de marineros fantasmas que vuelven de la muerte para buscar venganza entre la gente de un pequeño pueblo pesquero. We actually got the idea of the fog when we were at, in England to show Assault on Precinct 13 at the London Film Festival and we took a trip out to uh, Stonehenge and we looked across the meadow and there was this pulsating fog in the distance and John said to me, what do you think's in that fog? And I said, ghosts. And he said, let's write a fog story. One weekend, John and myself set out, starting like the bottom of California and driving all the way up the state till we found the perfect lighthouse. You know, the location for the fog was just, uh, I just came upon Inverness, California, and eventually ended up buying a house there. It's just a gorgeous place. And there's a little lighthouse down there. And that's what I, I said, here we are. This is the fog. This is where it takes place. One night he called me in Canada, having arrived at the Point Reyes National Seashore and the lighthouse in Inverness and said, well, I found the place that I want to live out the rest of my life. I want to die here. This is, this is it. This is the most incredible country I've ever seen. Just, you know, up the coastline of Bodega Bay where they shot the birds. So it's sort of co coincidental, but I think it probably was that same sort of desolate, isolated uh, shoreline that Hitchcock fell in love with, and so did we.
The lighthouse was down 365 steps. The camera equipment, the camera operators, the, you know, everything had to be carried down this just straight, heart, heartbreaking <laughs> flight of stairs. <laughs> Once you got down there, you didn't want to go back up. <laughs> John Carpenter and Adrian Barbeau uh, got married prior to us shooting The Fog. And it was sort of interesting because for me, it was really, it was very difficult because John and I had been a relationship, a couple, prior to that. To be honest, my memories of The Fog really were about my friend Deborah and how difficult it was because of Adrian. I, I really do feel that it was one of those things where, you know, it was difficult. I mean, it was just difficult. And so while they were on their honeymoon, I was writing Stevie Wayne, which I think is probably the best character Adrian's ever played, um, which is the star of The Fog. The first day we started The Fog, we'd only been married a couple months. We drove to work in separate cars, and we were very professional on the set. You know, we... I don't think we had lunch together or anything. We were very professional. And at the end of the day, one or the other of us said to the other one, this isn't very much fun. <laughs> you know? And then we lightened up, you know. I think I'll go to Vancouver now. John couldn't believe that I didn't get any jobs after Halloween. I got no jobs. The only jobs I got after Halloween was an episode of Charlie's Angels, where I played a lesbian golfer. They never knew I was a lesbian. You know, I, I made her gay, you know, what, inside, you know, internally. And I did a love boat episode with my mother. The coupling of Halloween and The Fog then led to other horror films going, ooh, we should put her in the movie because she's sort of that girl now. And then that's how that really took off. It was really the second movie that made that happen. I remember we were in, you know, shooting Poor Man's Process in a studio somewhere where it was just, you know, inside and young grips were running lights by the side of the car. And John was literally standing by the camera going like, ooh, here I come, I'm the bad fog. And you know, it's like, John, give me a break here. I'm trying to like, look scared. In un estilo similar al de Halloween, Carpenter dejó de lado los efectos sangrientos para favorecer a los horrores escondidos de la niebla. Blake, I have your ghost. Now, the, the scariest thing about the fog is you never really see what the ghosts look like, but you know that they're there and it's scary. John really sets up around his characters this sense of foreboding. And it's that, the idea that something's going to come out of the shadow, you just don't know what. Oh, no. I want to see who it is. No. Can I stay for two more seconds? Okay, okay, I'm going. Aunque Carpenter se estaba haciendo famoso por sus películas de terror, Muchos observaron que sus películas tenían similitudes con el western tradicional. I think he basically sees a lot of these uh, science fiction pictures, some of the horror films, as as westerns. I mean, it's such a s kind of simple archetypal type of drama, the the western. He used to have a uh, bumper sticker that says "God bless John Wayne" on the back of his Cadillac. Love John Wayne. One of the things that John early on uh, expressed was uh, a desire to remain true to the type of movies that he wanted to make and the way he wanted to make them. I got in this business to make westerns, and by the time I got in, uh, they weren't making them anymore unless they were Clint Eastwood. 
El amor por los westerns que tenía Carpenter venía de su niñez, en particular aquellas del veterano Howard Hawks, como por ejemplo Río Bravo y Río Colorado. I had seen movies that he had made, but was unaware of him or how they connected with other films. And all of a sudden, in, in film school, we had a retrospective. We saw all of his work from the silent films on, and it was a stunner to me. Well, this man is unbelievable. It is true of a number of Carpenter's best films, and it's also true of a number of, you know, Hawks' best films. And I, it's guys doing stuff is what makes the film go forward. What I loved about him was he appeared to be without technique. It appeared to be s seamless and simple, but that in itself is a style that's very, very difficult to do. So I studied his angles and his way of staging and what his concerns were. His action comes fast, it comes out of nowhere, it's fast and it's over with. And I've stolen from him as many times as I possibly can. There was a scene where a policeman throws a gun to a cop, and that's right out of Howard Hawks. I want to have to kill you, Mailer. With what? The, the Western thing is the, it's people at the very edge of civilization. And that is true of an awful lot of horror films, is that they're people in extremis. The vampire movie is a West, definitely a Western. That's an obvious Western with, you know, gunslingers and, and in a Western town. When I made Vampires, I decided I was going to lean a little bit towards Sam Peckinpah in terms of style. Peckinpah is kind of a genius show-off director. He shows you, he does all these different cameras in slow motion. I decided to give it a try. So there's a little bit more violence and blood, and people splitting open and stuff like that. Cuando se masacran a casi todos los miembros del equipo que busca vampiros, el héroe representado por James Woods busca venganza. Working with James Woods was interesting on vampires. He was a non-traditional choice for an action hero. And he would always want, he always wanted to play an action hero. He said, look, I, for years in my career, I've always gone through the door, the second or third person through. I usually have a suit on. I'm following Jodie Foster, I'm the, you know, either the bad guy, or I want to go through first with sunglasses on and a gun. It was here. Otro héroe de acción de Carpenter, el personaje de Snake Plissken, también fue basado en los forajidos del oeste. Plissken fue representado por el antiguo niño actor de Disney, Carl Russell, a quien Carpenter propulsó a las grandes películas. es el héroe de fuga de Nueva York una película en la cual el pueblo del oeste fue reemplazado por la violencia y decadencia urbana que refleja la fascinación de Carpenter por el estilo de las historietas la historia se desarrolla en una América futurista y autoritaria donde la isla de Manhattan ha sido transformada en una prisión de alta seguridad rodeada de cercos y minas Snake is a comic book character, you know, he's a grizzle and, and everything right down to the way he moves his face and his, the eye, he's a comic book character and he's living in a comic book world, it's this, you know, everything is slightly degraded, the place is full of street trash, it's, you know, larger than life punks, that sort of thing. And the reason that Escape from New York works as well as it does is it's made in exact, completely in keeping with that aesthetic. Well, Snake Plissken doesn't care. 
He doesn't care about hurting you or saving you. He just wants to move on. He doesn't have any concern except for himself. He has no higher cause. He has no sense of righteousness or, or a need to, to set right or wrong. You want to see him sprayed all over that map, baby? Where's the president? Where the gun, Snake? I don't know. With me. Why do you want to know? I want him. Una segunda parte de mayor presupuesto que Fuga de Nueva York fue Fuga de Los Ángeles, la cual se hizo una década después. La inspiración provino del terremoto de California en 1994. Al igual que en La Gran Manzana, las aventuras en La Gran Naranja se desarrollan entre una mezcla de amigos, desalmados y enemigos. We hadn't worked together in a long time, I don't know, seven years maybe. And uh, he said, action, I came down the hill, whatever it was, I came down the hill, did the look at the sign or something, walked on, cut, and it was like we had finished Escape from New York on Friday and started Escape from L.A. on Monday. It was like we had the weekend off. Entre una película y otra pasaron 15 años y para la segunda parte se invirtieron 50 millones de dólares. Después de la pausa, una cabeza humana con patas de araña escandaliza al público y Carpenter decide mostrar su lado tierno en una película con Jeff Bridges. John Carpenter. <laughs> Thought you might try that hot shot. That's why the first clip is loaded with blanks. Bye bye, Snake. Good luck. John called me and he said, uh, I'm going to do a sequel to Escape from New York. I'm going to escape from L.A. And how would you like to be Lee Van Cleef? That's, that was the way he said it. And I said, sounds great to me. It was a great part. Kurt and John and Deborah Hill had written this screenplay. I read it. I came in, supposedly to do a reading for it. We didn't talk at all about the part. We didn't talk about the film. We wanted all the gossip on Dennis Hopper and Easy Rider. It was hysterical. The pay wasn't bad. The best part, though, was with John and Kurt Russell together. They have such a good, long relationship. Being allowed in, even for a moment, on that friendship, that's better than the pay. John's an extremely loyal person who gathers around him time after time a team uh, that he trusts, that he enjoys working with, that he knows will deliver, because John has a tendency to work in a sort of a lower budget range, and so therefore he knows he needs people who are willing to go above and beyond the call to help him get his vision on the screen. And uh, in order to do that, in that kind of intensely, intensely emotionally and physically stressful situation, it's always nice to have people around you while you're working that you can trust. John's way of making it is you create this family, you know, and, and you know what to expect of everybody. Try to have a good time on the set. It's always been my philosophy. Uh, make it a nurturing experience, but that's not always possible with some personalities. Some people need different things to create, and oftentimes it's adversity, or they need to create adversity. Casi todas las películas que Carpenter lanzó contenían varias referencias a Howard Hawks. Finalmente dio el paso lógico y rehizo una de las películas de su propio mentor, el thriller de ciencia ficción de 1951, La Cosa. La historia trata de una expedición polar que descubre los restos congelados de una nave espacial. 
La nave alberga un organismo que cambia su apariencia y puede imitar otras formas de vida. Fue la primera gran producción de estudio de Carpenter y con ella quería demostrar que podía dar un vuelco en su carrera. You know, to push everything as far as possible, the best bits of Halloween or the best bits of Assault and Precinct 13 are things that are done really, the best bits of Dark Star, done on a really, really tight budget and they have to be inventive. Of course, with the advent of the uh, late 70s and early 80s and filmmakers like George Romero, suddenly audiences got a taste for gore. So the climate for special effects had changed. Suddenly movies weren't necessarily just about a scary horror story, but then you suddenly needed this grotesque imagery to go along with it. In the case of The Thing, it's, well, what if you actually could demonstrate a shape-shifting alien? You know, what if it was possible? And together with Rob Bottin, they suddenly found themselves at a time in cinema history when they could. <laughs> I think it's one of the very few special effects movies in which you genuinely go, oh! I mean, I remember seeing it for the first time and the sequence in which the guy's head falls off and the spider legs come out and the head scuttles across the floor and somebody looks at it and says, you've got to be kidding. And that's the point of the film. The point of the film is you, you, you can't believe you're seeing this stuff. Gotta be f***ing kidding. Luego de una larga y ardua filmación, la cosa tuvo una recepción inesperadamente hostil. It really got lambasted by the critics. I mean, there, there were there were people that that were so shocked that this movie was made and pointed to John directly as, it's his fault. How could this guy make this movie when E.T. is out and E.T. has everyone feeling good about themselves and happy, and then suddenly this movie comes out with this shape-shifting creature that's dark. said this this is not going to be appreciated for 20 years because this monster is so bad he's so ugly they're not going to see the story about 12 12 guys in paranoia it's just a story about paranoia and the breakdown of of human beings believing in each other muy afectado por la reacción negativa de la cosa la carrera posterior de carpenter apuntó a diferentes direcciones con distintos grados de éxito comercial y de la crítica My agent said, you need to do something that uh, you atone for your sin. You need to make something nice. So Starman, a movie later, I did, did Christine, then Starman came along. He said, it's going to be perfect. You know, people will like you again. Is that you can show them that you can make a nice romantic comedy. It has kind of a nice sentimental scene in the end, and it's sweet. Really, nobody dies. I think a lot of why Starman was his next film was to prove to a lot of people that Yes, John Carpenter is a filmmaker. He's not out to just, you know, tell all these really bleak, uh, dark, desolate films that he actually has a, a lot of different kind of movies in his, uh, in his repertoire. I don't think Carpenter is a pessimist. I think actually he's a pretty optimistic guy. He's, you know, he's a guy having fun, even in his darker moments. En los años posteriores a Starman y La Cosa, Carpenter prefirió trabajar con películas independientes sobre las cuales él mantenía el máximo control creativo. Muchas de esas películas regresaron a su continua preocupación con extraterrestres, la religión y la decadencia urbana. Yo 
I'm fascinated by religion in, in films. I'm always dealing with the Prince of Darkness and the Fog, and a lot of these movies have priests, and it's about religion. It's so wonderful what you're doing, Father. Opening the church again. Príncipe de las Tinieblas contiene una mezcla ambiciosa de física cuántica, teología y terror gótico puesta en un ambiente apocalíptico de un final inminente. Carpenter continuó con su línea independiente. Y películas como En la boca del miedo, Pueblo de los malditos y Ghost of Mars reafirmaron la inconfundible marca de Carpenter quien posee una habilidad técnica sobresaliente y un control riguroso como director. ¡Acción! If I was going to produce a movie and I only had 10 million dollars, but I wanted it to look like 25. And I wanted it to be special in the way it looked like a 25. I probably have to call on him because um, he's so practiced at it. He's so That's where his gift is. That, that's where his real gift is. I think it's so overwhelming. It's like the Alamo. I could please. Thank you. I know this, that John is a dreamer. And I hope that he is able to make that big dream of his come true. I think he's still working in that direction. I feel that, that all of the aspects of his, his abilities to express himself with music, with scariness, with... Uh, humor are all sort of coming together now and I think as a mature artist he's going to give us his best work down the line I don't believe my work life would have ever been what it has been if it wasn't for John Carpenter you know he's weird looking uh, there's no question he I wouldn't bring him over to my house he'd scare the shit out of my kids but um, uh, but I have gratitude to him for what he did for me I think John is a self-made man, self-made director, who's been able to have an enormously successful career and not compromise in any way his vision. And he, I don't believe he ever will. Action! There are very few directors whose names mean anything to the public. And John Carpenter's means something. I suspect that part of the reason it means such a lot to him is just sheer bloody-mindedness. It's just, you know, I am a director, these are my films, here is my name above them. Thank you very much. I've been lucky enough to have my name associated with my movies. One day I will be gone from this earth, and I want at least to somebody in the future to look at my movies and realize they're mine. They, they, they may be screwed up and you may not like them, but they're my movies. La nueva película de John Carpenter se llama Fantasmas en Marte, protagonizada por Natasha Henstridge. La película nos lleva a un pueblo minero en el planeta rojo 175 años en el futuro. El pueblo está sobre los restos de una antigua civilización que reaparece en forma de fantasma. Respetado.